coming up. What I really like about Mogna is that we can show any art, and we have shown any art, and we show the latest contemporary Native art. Patsy Phillips shares with us her journey into the museum world where she advocates for contemporary Native artists and students. And... The thing about the blowgun, uh, it's a simple weapon. I mean, you know, I can teach anybody how to burn out a blowgun or straighten one out in a day or two. Learn how Danny McCarter is taking traditions his mentors taught him and continuing to pass on this knowledge to future generations. And see how Daniel Mink creates a visual identity for our tribe by combining traditional designs with his own iconic style. More of a cultural designer. And I kind of see myself as trying to combine traditional art to a modern look. Plus, we look at the final years of Principal Chief John Ross's life as he navigates the end of the Civil War and the consequences of a nation divided. So he's sick and bedridden and still seeing this treaty to the end. Ross is, is making sure that the nation is, is renewed and maintained and is not broken up through this moment. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning, growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Welcome to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, capital city of the Cherokee Nation. For generations, the Cherokee story has been told by others. Today, through this groundbreaking series, we're taking ownership of our own story and telling it as beautifully and authentically as we can. I hope you enjoy these profiles of our people, our language, our history, and our culture. And please make plans to come visit us sometime. What else? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, at the Cherokee National History Museum in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, where this historic marker commemorates Principal Chief John Ross. We'll have more on Principal Chief Ross a little bit later in our Cherokee Almanac. As director of the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, Patsy Phillips lives life in many colors. Her work and advocacy for contemporary indigenous artists pushes the boundaries for what native art can represent. What I really like about Mogna is that we can show any art, and we have shown any art, and we show the latest contemporary Native art. I just like the work that challenges people to rethink what they know. And I also discovered there was a need to educate people about contemporary Native arts. Here, that's all we're about. We don't do any traditional art. We don't do any historic works. It's all contemporary. OCO, I'm Patsy Phillips, a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and I'm the director for the IAI Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. And I'd like to recognize the Pueblo. We're on their land here in Santa Fe. My family's Cherokee from the Cherokee Nation. My mother, she's full blood Cherokee, and my dad is Irish. So this is Grandpa's grave. My grandmother never spoke English. My mother and all her siblings are Cherokee speakers. It was a time in our country where people didn't want their offspring to speak their native language. Growing up, I was confused about my identity. My Cherokee family were just so kind and I loved them. My Irish family, they were a little rougher. My father went to third grade. He never learned how to read or write. And my mother learned to read and write, but you know, she only went to the eighth grade. So education wasn't encouraged in my family at all. 
When I was 29, I had an opportunity to move to Paris, France, to join my boyfriend who was living there. And when I arrived, he left. And so my motto used to be, if you're gonna be dumped, Paris is the place. And it was there I just decided I wanted to change my life. For me, education was everything. When I was at SMU, I met Professor William Pulte. He was an anthropologist, a linguist, and he went to Tahlequah and lived with the Cherokees and studied my grandfather and my uncle. That was really interesting to me. When I graduated in 92, I met the founding director for the National Museum of the American Indian, Rick West. And I said, I'm considering going to Harvard for this museum program. And he said, absolutely, we need more natives in the field. So when I was ready to work for the National Museum of the American Indian, I just called Rick West and I said, okay, I'm ready to work for you. And he just laughed out loud. And then within six weeks, I was in Washington, D.C., working for the National Museum of the American Indian. I really have always liked art. I didn't know when I started my education that that's the direction I would go. The president of the Institute of American Indian Arts was looking for a director for the museum. He called Rick West, and Rick West said Patsy Phillips. You know, within six weeks, I was living here, working as the director. One of my favorite things about Santa Fe is hiking. It just helps clear my head. It also helps me to just get away and feel like I'm somewhere else. When I came to the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, what I liked about it immediately is we can show anything we want to show here. Right now, the staff's working really hard. In two days, our new exhibition will open. And I'm going to say it's one of our most important exhibitions we've ever done. I'm not a curator, but I hire the best curators. I first met Patsy in person when I was actually pitching that uh, traveling exhibition at my last working place, uh, Crystal Bridges. And I was impressed that she made time to meet me and made time to discuss the exhibition proposal. Not every museum director <laughs> makes time to, to listen to a curator. She not only listens, but it's hardly ever a no. Our upcoming exhibition is titled Exposure, Native Art and Political Ecology. The exhibition uh, documents nuclear exposure on Indian land internationally. We have more than 50 artists represented in this exhibition and each one of them is uh, personally affected by these problems. The museum has always been instrumental in giving Native artists a voice to voice their opinion on current issues in Indian country. There is no other museum in the nation that is solely dedicated to support contemporary Native arts through exhibitions, programs, and I think uh, exhibitions like Exposure really um, confirm that we are very serious about this mission statement. II has a mentorship program, and I've signed on since it first started, and I always mentor students. I have three courses that I've developed and taught, and then I always guest lecture. I always take students if there's an international trip and it changes their lives, like it changed mine when I first got in the field. One of the things I tell the students, I have an open door policy, so they can come anytime that they're downtown. But I always, always take time for a student. And I do because people took time for me. The exposure, native art and political ecology, it really, to me, encapsulates everything that we do and want to do here. That is, we want to bring attention to the issues that Native peoples are facing, and this will do it. A lifelong teacher and Cherokee national treasure, Danny McCarter is a name synonymous with the Cherokee blowgun. Weaving through a cane break, he tells us the importance of helping others and listening to our elders. 
My name is Danny McCarter. My name is pretty synonymous with the blowgun. I mean, I've been doing it for oh, 30 years, and I've taught a lot of classes, showed a lot of people, and so really, um, most people know me as a blowgun maker. I was uh, born and raised here in Tahoe, Oklahoma. I work at the Cherokee National History Museum. We share the culture with the people who come, uh, the visitors who come. Yeah, Cher Cherokees are big on stories. You know, my my whole life's one big story. The reason I do things is because of the stories I'm told. When I was a little kid, my Aunt Fanny, when she taught me how to tie my shoes. And so when I got sent to school at that time, um, Nobody knew how to tie their shoes but me. But I, I would spend almost my whole recess tying people's shoes. I mean, because they'd come up and tie my shoe, tie my shoe. So I think that's kind of where I developed that, you know, got to help somebody. I started working in the ancient village in 1980. And I wanted to be the blowgun guy because that's what William Cabbage Head did. And I, I was kind of young at that time. So they said, well, you know, we make you a tour guide. I give tours, I, I talk to people, I, I give them stories, and, uh, but uh, shooting the blowgun for people, again, like I said, that that it's really so amazing to small, small children. I mean, you know, you just poof, and you shoot that gun, and when that dart hits that, that target, you know, uh, them kids will just, wow, you know, and that, that's always amazing, that always makes you feel good. They always had that motto, you know, to teach, preserve, promote Cherokee history and culture. And that's what they've done. If you spend enough time here, you will. I mean, it's just fall in love with the place. It's, I mean, it, it really makes an impression on you when you come here. A lot of our Cherokee National Treasures, that's where a lot of them got their craft, was working in the village. I myself, I've learned from a lot of different people. You know, William being one of them, uh, Jess Ossowee being another. Uh, Scott Ratcliffe, uh, the man I worked with at the uh, Heritage Center, uh, he had a lot to do with uh, with my outlook on on you know River Kane. All those guys are Cherokee National Treasures. In a sense, though, Cherokee National Treasures are people who pass along their information. See, it's like they're gone now, but I'm still remembering the things that they taught us. So um, that's where it never really uh, goes away. I'm a member of the Thistle Society. Now, the Thistle Society is like uh, people who have won the Cherokee National Holiday, they'll give you a pin. The first blowgun shoot I shot in, they was like 1979, I think. And at that time, William Cabbage Head was probably the best shooter. He won a lot of uh, blowgun shoots over the years. And uh, different people, you know, get in there and win. And so it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And the blowgun is really something that everybody falls in love with. That's something they want to do, you know. Uh, and so I've taught a lot of people, you know. How, and the thing about the blowgun, uh, it's a simple weapon. I mean, you know, I can teach anybody how to burn out a blowgun or straighten one out in a day or two, you know. But the darts, you know, the darts, that's the art part of it, I mean. Because even me, after all the darts I've made, every now and then I'll mess up. And I taught a class here at the Heritage Center one time, and a guy came all the way from Louisiana just to take the class, you know, because he'd seen some of my videos. That that always kind of uh, made me feel good, because, you know, the sense of pride that somebody has when they make a blowgun in a dart and they shoot it, you know, it's like, you know, they really accomplished something. Then I taught, you know, hundreds of people. And so out of those hundreds of people that I taught, there'll be people that will teach other people how to do it. Being named a Cherokee National Treasure is something that I will uh, hold near and dear to me for as long as I live. I mean, um, I, it really feels good to be in the company of, of all the people I've talked about, and they'll always be remembered. There's always uh, something that they've done. That, that, And I'm hoping that you know people will feel the same way about me, you know, uh, when my time comes, you know. I've always tried to represent the Cherokees uh, to the best of my ability. Uh, my mom, though, always put things in perspective because she said, you know, always tell me, don't be proud of what you are. Be proud of who you are. Be proud of the way you treat people. Like I said, River Cane is, is one of the most, 
one of the most important things to the Cherokees. I think that's one of the reasons why the, the Cherokees uh, model themselves after the river cane is because I could pull this, I could dig this plant up. I can take it somewhere and transplant it. And the thing about it, it's gonna grow. It's gonna prosper. Before long, there'll be more cane coming up. We wanna grow, we wanna prosper. And that's what we've done, you know, for the last 200 years. With a career spanning decades, few individuals have influenced the Cherokee Nation like Principal Chief John Ross. In this Cherokee Almanac, we take a look at the final year of his life and observe the adversity he faced and the perseverance he displayed to the very end. Throughout the destructive period of the U.S. Civil War and early Reconstruction, Principal Chief John Ross strove to maintain the strength and unity of the Cherokee Nation. Chief Ross's work in these few years would go on to affect the future of the Cherokee Nation for decades. Little did he know, this period would also mark the final chapter of his life. You know, the American Civil War in, in Indian Territory uh, had, its, had its largest toll on, on, in Cherokee Nation. The countryside really kind of basically vacated, and um, you know there, there was hardly a, a house left standing. Despite the Cherokee Nation's sovereignty from the United States, we remained caught in the middle of the conflict, pressured to choose a side. John Ross's um, loyalties were with the Cherokee Nation. He wasn't interested in joining the Civil War at all. He really wanted the Cherokee Nation to maintain its neutrality. However, Confederate sentiment was growing within the Cherokee Nation. Many prominent Cherokees were pushing for a treaty with the South, including one of Ross's greatest political rivals, Stan Wadey. Stan Wadey had decided, you know, on his own that he would voluntarily um, build a regiment for, uh, for the Confederacy, you know, of Cherokee troops. Ross didn't have much of a hand to play after that. If he wanted to keep the nation together, he kind of had to sign that treaty with the Confederacy. While the treaty with the South was an attempt to maintain unity behind the scenes, Cherokee politics had fractured. Ross and his followers sympathized with the Union, while the Wadey faction sided with the South. Foreseeing the war ending in Union victory, Ross and his Northern Cherokee delegation traveled to Washington, D.C. to begin negotiating a post-war treaty with the United States. Ross had made it, uh, made it clear that there were Cherokees that, that were participating with the federal army, with, you know, with the federal cause, and that their intentions were fully with the Union at that point. Back in the Cherokee Nation, the Wadey faction capitalized on Ross's absence by manifesting a separate government, with Wadey as their principal chief. Wadey even went as far as to ransack Ross's home, Rose Cottage, attacking Ross's daughter and killing her husband before burning the cottage to the ground. These two groups had really had differences, you know, all the way back, you know, to the late 1820s, early 1830s. These are old wounds that go all the way back to, you know, to the removal and the signing of the Treaty of New Echota. Even with the Civil War ending in Confederacy defeat, the Wadey faction continued to work against Ross arguing their Southern delegation should be the voice of the Cherokee Nation in U.S. treaty negotiations. Wadey's Southern delegates found an ally in Dennis N. Cooley, the U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs. He is one of those who kind of recognizes that these divisions can be exploited. Undermining Ross is going to, um, is going to actually be more useful to the federal government. Cooley recognizes that and kind of writes about these, these issues and really works to undermine Ross. Cooley published The Cherokee Question, distorting Ross's political dealings to depict him as an enemy of the United States. While battling the efforts of Wadey and Cooley, Ross faced even more hardship in his personal life. His wife, Mary Stapler Ross, fell gravely ill and passed away, and Ross's own health was beginning to fail as well. Meanwhile, the Cherokee question proved effective, and Cooley presented a treaty with the Southern Cherokee delegation to the Johnson administration. In the final hour, the Northern Cherokee delegation brought forth documents supporting Ross's loyalty to the U.S., documents that had been withheld by Cooley. All treaty conditions proposed by Cooley and the Southern Cherokees were abandoned, 
and Ross's northern delegation negotiated a new treaty signed on July 19, 1866. Ross's efforts proved victorious, however, he would never see the fruits of his labor. On August 1, 1866, John Ross passed away, ending a 38-year-long career as principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. Over the course of his career, Chief Ross led our people through great upheavals, forced removal, the Civil War, times of immense difficulty and loss. Even with his health failing, he never lost sight of his goal for a strong, unified Cherokee Nation. Let's talk Cherokee. Hi, Sinas, what are you doing? Osio Uwaria Jalegi Ini Wani Skesti. Hawa. Osta. Sinas. Kado Hadane. Do Gwesti. Gadi ha. Do Gwesti. Den de ha. Ni Ejula. Do Gwesti. Den de ha. Hawa. Daniel Mink overcame many obstacles to earn his degree in graphic design. His work, rooted in ancestral designs, creates a modern visual identity for Cherokee Nation. Daniel's vision and iconic style are seen by people all over the world. To take my culture, my heritage, and to put it into the form of art, form of design, I feel like now I've contributed something to the bigger picture to our people, to our story. My name is Dan Mink. Um, I'm the lead graphic designer for the Cherokee Nation uh, Communications Office. I'm more of a cultural designer. I do ads, brochures, posters, t-shirts, and I kind of see myself as trying to combine traditional art to a modern look. I think one of the most beautiful and brilliant things about Dan's work is how he incorporates not only these motifs that have been around for thousands of years and that our ancestors have used, but he puts them alongside vibrant modern design elements. Dan's work really reaches everybody on a global level because a lot of his work is used to portray Cherokee Nation to the outside world. And so I think it's really important how accurate his work is and how beautiful his work is because it really serves as the face of Cherokee Nation. My job here when I was hired was to create an identity for us, a distinctive look for the Cherokee Nation. Now here we are, I mean, 15, 16 years later. Here, here, here in this office, this is where it began. I don't say a lot, and I'm not really, I don't really speak that much. A lot, a lot goes in my head. There's a lot of emotions involved in some of these designs and creations. When um, I finally got the chance to work for the Cherokee Nation, I was really excited because I could bring a skill to the culture, to bring language, to bring um, our own identity as a Southeastern tribe, uh, Mississippian mound builder art, uh, which I didn't know existed really until I started working here. Because I was used to seeing, you know, Plains Indian designs all my life, you know, the geometric design. But here, it was organic, flowing, serpentine type designs that I was seeing. Uh, this is for the, our judicial system, justice system. It has our seven-pointed star on there and then our 
our seal and then the, the wreaths. The two wreaths represent the cooperation between the Cherokee Nation and the state of Oklahoma. The seven points here are the, represents the seven clans and the scales, scales of justice, there's 14 and, and that represents our 14 county area of our reservation. To incorporate those designs into the Cherokee Nation, to the um, look of the tribe, to um, set us apart from different tribal organizations, and then to incorporate my language, because uh, I grew up speaking Cherokee. Well, that, was my, that was my first language. When I get a chance to incorporate the Cherokee language into the designs, it's always a, a, a plus. What I look forward to every year is the Cherokee National Holiday. That's, I guess, the highlight of the year for me as a designer to come up with the next poster for that year. I've been working on the uh, Cherokee National Holiday posters since 2004. To have the opportunity to create this year in, year out for my tribe, it brings pride to me, just in a really personal level. When I started on this, this journey, it was to get an education. I grew up um, south of Stillwell, Oklahoma. I was uh, one of eight kids, the youngest of the boys. and. Uh, had a, a birth defect, so called a spina bifida. It was a, a milder form of it, what I was told. But I made the best of it. I uh, picked up drawing kind of early. As far as I can remember, I've, uh, I've had a pencil and a piece of paper. But when I got older, I started thinking about what am I going to do? So. To just be here now, that's more than enough for me. If my art contributes just a little bit to the bigger picture, the bigger story, then all that stuff, all what life has molded me into, uh, as you see here today, I mean, it's paid off, it's worked. I mean, it's it's been worth it. But I, uh, you know, come a long way. A long way, really. I had no idea I would be doing this. All I wanted, really, when I started out to, was just to get an education and a job. I wanted to give back. So it's the way uh, my creator said to give. This is what he gave me to give back. So here, here it is. We hope you enjoyed our show, and remember you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dodadago Hai. Wado.